right, guys. Facebook is online. We are bringing Instagram and YouTube online. All right, we are hitting live. Oops. I got to turn my lights on for you guys. So, all right, we are live on Instagram. We are live on Facebook. We are live on YouTube. Jay Colley, how you doing, bud? Nick Stevens, good evening. Charles Buchanan, good evening, brother. So I am actually um, a little bit late tonight. I was actually on the phone with a uh, Elk Calling Academy member that uh, was down in New Mexico out on a hunt and actually just called in his first bull this evening so was chit chatting with him a little bit rick tilton love wapity wednesday thanks for joining us tonight uh let's see over on instagram we've got elk wild pack him out apparel bride bride dizzle owl 2020 uh ludu statonia so sorry if i butchered that um solo elk hunter tim preston from youtube anthony j boyd good evening I'll tell you what, guys, the pictures are starting to roll in from Elk Calling Academy members, and I'm absolutely loving it. Seeing the pictures, hearing the stories, I just, I'll tell you what, guys, that's, that's what really gets me, hearing your success and, and how you took something that you heard from either a Wapiti Wednesday or if, you know, members of the Patreon page went out and you know put those to practice out in the field and found success for the first time that is why i do it guys it just takes me back to you know my first bull and when i started so absolutely love it so larry how you doing bud cody collins watching from elk camp this evening thanks for all the info come to colorado and call a bull in for me Oh, well, Cody, I'm, I'm envious that you are watching from Elk Camp because I am sitting here, and especially after last weekend, and I'll kind of talk about it a little bit. So, uh, evening, everyone. Headed to bed. Have to catch an early flight tomorrow. Brian Draper, thanks for popping in. DFD is in the house. How are you doing, buddy? Hopefully, you have remembered your quiver on your more recent hunts. So... Uh, look like y'all had a nice weekend. Congrats, Bill Berry. Yeah, we'll talk about it. It was uh, it was a pretty good weekend. Steve, outdoor guy, how you doing? Uh, Bangham Outdoors, uh, Cag Bets, Caleb Newton. So uh, can't wait till tomorrow. Off work till October. Patrick, you lucky dog. Uh, hey, Michael. Hope all is well. Headed to Arizona Unit 27 in the morning. Headed out again tomorrow. Uh, Charles had a bull 44 yards, but was frontal, had to pass. Yeah, it's a pretty pretty long shot for a uh, frontal shot. Uh, Miggy, Iggy, Iggy tuning in from Astoria. So, all right, guys, let's jump into it. So, um, hey, everybody, my name is Michael Batiste. I'm from the Elk Calling Academy, and this is Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. So if this is your first time tuning in, first off, welcome. We're glad that you tuned in and that you joined us tonight. The way Wapiti Wednesday works is to typically start with a subject. And so tonight we're going to talk about, you know, archery elk hunting, public land ethics. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, some of the other questions that I've been getting really a lot lately. And also we're going to recap last weekend's hunt with what I saw, elk activity and that kind of stuff. Now. If this is your first time, it doesn't matter if you're joining us from Instagram, YouTube, or Facebook, you do have the option and opportunity that you can put your questions in live, and we will answer those. Uh, there is some information that I do hold back because we do have a members uh, page at elkcallingacademy.com where those guys get the full access to all of the tutorials that I have, and those tutorials cover cow sounds, bull sounds, what they mean, how to do them, calling strategies that we do to us e-scouting tutorials we also have discount codes with brand partner deals we have gear giveaways uh, we also have a community tab where uh, members themselves can go in and chit chat and communicate and even you know line up to you know hunt together so um, but anyways 
welcome glad you're here and also if this is your first time or you're enjoying the content make sure that you hit that like subscribe or follow button no matter which channel that you're on so you're always notified when we go live or upload a new video so all right so let's let's kind of jump into the hunting ethics because i've had a few people kind of approach me about this lately so prasmataz how you doing miss lena yes i know i still owe you a gift so i'm trying to figure out tenor and Instagram, but Lena, I'll get you that gif as soon as I can. So, all right. So hunting ethics, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, on the mountainside, I mean, we hunt public ground, it's public property, it's free for everybody to go to. But honestly, if you really think about it, it's really out of your control. Okay, you cannot control other people, you can only control your actions. So really, when you are on the mountainside and you do bump into somebody or you have an interaction with people, it doesn't do any good to get upset or be the a-hole or this or that. Because honestly, how you approach the situation is really what I have found going to determine the outcome of that situation. Now, first off, you guys have already talked about or, or you heard me talk about... Um, you know, if I get to a trailhead and somebody is there before me, I'm just going to go someplace else. I'm not going to go in behind them. Hunting elk on public land is difficult enough. And to have people climbing and crawling all over each other just makes it worse. It doesn't do anybody any good. Um, and in fact, last weekend, we actually ran into two different groups uh the first group we were we were set up and we were working three bulls um and we heard some people coming up underneath us you know knew it was a person could tell by the calling but they were cool about it because as soon as they got close enough and saw one of my shooters they realized that it was people and they backed off they backed off and looped around ironically we ran into them about two hours later and those spikes that we were working those spikes had gone right by us and down to down to them and they got a shot at one of them and they had actually tracked it and as soon as i heard them go low i got the guys together and said okay they're going low we're going to go high we're going to gain elevation so we altered our plan uh, that we were definitely going to stay low on the on the plane that we were on but since they were down low, we went ahead and went high. But when we ran into them, you know, they were like, hey, sorry, we didn't know that was people. As soon as we realized, you know, we went low and we were planning on staying low. And I basically said, yeah, as soon as we knew you guys were low, we went high. And so we started talking, you know, where do you guys normally park if you come in this area? OK, well, we normally park here. And I explained, you know, up here on the mountain, we basically hunt from this ridge to this ridge is day one, from that ridge to that ridge is day two, and this ridge is, and that ridge is day three. So basically, now we each know that I, we know where they park, they know where we park. And so, you know, we actually go by their parking place where they like to park to get to where we like to park. So now they know that when they come in, they're going to loop up to where we park first before they go because they want to see if we're in there or not because they agree there's plenty enough room up there and we don't need to be clamoring all over each other second group same thing you know i was nice and polite talking to them hey okay you know where are you guys hunting what are you doing and i didn't have that attitude and you see it a lot of times on public ground where somebody will walk up and it's just like what are you doing here what are you doing up here why are you hunting here? And, and, and immediately it's that it's that gruff on edge. Well, and exactly that's what you're going to get back. If, if you go, if you approach that and hit it with that attitude, that's exactly what you're going to get back. But if you approach it with, hey, how you doing? Okay, oh, where'd you guys come in from? Mm, is that your normal route? What do you guys normally do? Where do you normally like to hunt? And it was kind of cool because now what I've determined between the two groups 
is the first group really likes to hunt this area. The second group really likes to hunt this area. Well, we really like to hunt the middle. And so basically what we've all determined is that that group to the south is going to hunt up to a certain ridge. Then we're going to hunt from that ridge to this ridge. And then the other group is going to hunt from that ridge north. We are all sitting there because we took the time to talk to each other. And now we all have game plans and none of us are going to be interfering or inter you know, crawling all over. If one of us happens to be working a bull and the other one try to, oh, I'm going to cut him off, that doesn't do anybody good. No good at all. So now if you're in a new area and you hear somebody calling, if they're ahead of you or this or that, do the right thing. Peel off. Be that guy that's going to peel off. Go find your own spot. Go find another spot. You And sometimes when we've done this, we have found some little pockets that were even better than what we wanted to hunt before. The other thing is, is, is yeah, it's frustrating that when you're set up and you're working a bull and somebody comes up over the top of you. You can't control it. There are people out there that have no ethics. They have no respect because they have that. My family's hunted here for four generations and this is our spot and our mountain. And you know, you hear that all the time. And like I said, you can't control other people, but you can control your actions. And also the other thing with this too, is you really have two choices in this. You can stay and deal with that individual that you know you're going to have to deal with time and time again. Or you can go to someplace else and have a much better hunt where you don't have to deal with that type of people. But the also the thing that I found from that is it's amazing how much information that you can get from people if you're just calm and talk. Because it's amazing on the mountainside how many people like to brag about how good of a hunter they are, how successful they are, how many elk their family has taken out of that area over the years, their hunt patterns, when they're coming up to hunt, when they're heading back to town, this and that. You can basically get a lot of information from them that then all of a sudden you can adjust. Okay, these guys are leaving on Sunday and they're not going to be back until Thursday. That means I have Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to hunt this area. But then I have to come up with a different plan for when they are up here. So you can sit there and really, really get a lot of information and then adjust your hunt accordingly. And if you're willing to do that, it's amazing how much more success you will find and also how you kind of all of a sudden start to avoid people. Now, you know there's a lot of people in there. You know it's public ground. It's a popular area. You know there's people in there. But because of these conversations, you've kind of learned their patterns and then you adjust where you go and then you're going to find a lot more success. Uh, Charles, no, I am out of ECA decals for the truck right now. So uh, let's see. What else do we got? Uh, to, 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 to. Can you talk about cow calls a bit? Maybe different ones. Everyone is always talking bugles, and I feel like cow calls get overlooked a lot. Well, Matthew, cow calls are actually a great way to set up bugles, and that's one of the things that I do in, on the elkcallingacademy.com is I, I break all those sounds down. So... Um, Okay, first, uh, let's see. That's what I had. I was coming back for my hunt. I had three guys asked if they were there in the morning. I didn't remember passing a camp. Uh, first words out of the guy's mouth. How come you weren't here last weekend? You know, and a lot of times, I, I mean, that's the thing that when I was talking to those other groups too, they were like, wow, you know, we've hunted up here 40 years. We've hunted up here 20 years, and we've never seen anybody up here and I was jo and I was kind of chuckling because everybody that we've ran up into this area has hunted there 20, 30, 40 years and they've never seen anybody else up there. But there's quite a few people up there. So, um kind of interesting. So, so anyways, 
on the ethics deal, you cannot control the ethics of others. You can only really control your ethics. And it, like, like I said, it doesn't do any good to get upset, fly off the handle. It can actually make situations worse. How you approach it and how you approach them with the attitude and the tone in your voice will make all the difference in the world. So, uh, Bri Bri Dizzle, my uncle is that a-hole. That's why I don't hunt with him anymore. We all have one. Uh, Scott, when you're calling and hear a person calling back, is there a way you let them know you're not an elk and to stop following you? Sometimes, yes. Um, you know, we actually did have that happen. God, I can't remember what day it was, but um, we uh, went up into an area and hooked hooked up to the left because we were following some tracks, and we knew there was a guy that parked on down the road a ways and, and hunted this face. We didn't know if he went left or right from where he parked, but we were set up doing a blind calling scenario and um, heard him start calling and come up. And so I kind of started focusing my attention on him because I wanted to call him up. I wanted to talk to him to see where he went, but he got close enough to realize that, you know, we were people and then he peeled off left. And so we went ahead and peeled off right. We had a lot of, ooh, what is that? I have no idea what just happened with the screen on Instagram. It just went purple and really weird. Can you guys see okay on Instagram? Because my phone, maybe my iPhone's dying. I don't know. Um, but anyways, so, you know, we, we went ahead and peeled right just because we didn't, want to interfere or anything like that so um okay so you guys can't see i don't know what is going on with the instagram feed okay that camera's okay there we go got it back i don't know what happened so just purple lines okay that's the same thing i was seeing so we got that fixed so uh, Huffs, Grunts, and Wines for the win on two or on day two of the season here in North Idaho. Yes, Dennis, congratulations on your bull. Kenneth Jorgensen, Vince Martin. So is the screen better for you guys on Instagram? I'm not seeing the purple lines anymore. Um, howdy, Tim from Arizona heading out tomorrow. Good luck to you. Uh, Chad jo Jones, no, no noise in my area yet. So... Chad, we'll kind of talk about that here uh, in a minute when I do a recap of last weekend. So, uh, do you shave and haircut on the tube? Sometimes we will be amazed and elk can do that sound. Oh, yeah, Kevin, I know. Um, yeah, shave and a haircut, five cents. Okay, took me a minute. Uh, Instagram went to purple line, switched to YouTube, no issues here. Yeah, FS, I actually just fixed the screen over on Instagram. So if that ever happens, now I know what happened. So, okay, second thing that I've been getting a lot of questions about or a lot of comments about is I've been getting a lot of people saying they're not hearing any bugles or they um, have gone into their normal areas and the just the elk signs not there and what's going on and think back a little bit ago where we did a Wapiti Wednesday Q&A where we talked about hunting elk in a dry year versus hunting elk in a wet year and remember I said in a wet year which we are right now in a wet year there's a lot more food and that food is spread out all over. There's also a lot more water because these creeks that sometimes are dried up by the time elk season comes around in a, in a dry year, well, because it's so wet, those creeks are still running. So these elk have more food and more water in places that they typically don't have them in. So what you end up happening is these elk are spread out. So instead of being congregated numbers, and so this high concentration of sign that you're used to seeing in your normal area because it's a normal year or a dry year, well now because it's a wet year, you don't have that large congregation of elk because they're spread out more because they have that food and that's what's going on. The other thing that is basically going on that when you have them spread out like that, 
because the bulls are spread out with their cows, your competition actually diminishes because you know your bull to cow ratio all of a sudden changes at that point because you don't have all these bulls right on top of each other they're spread out more so that's why you may not be hearing as much bugling action but again this is what i'm hearing from everybody too we went and we did this and we did that and we didn't get a single response and again, you guys know what my question is going to be. Really, you didn't get a single response. Nope, we didn't hear a single bugle. Now, wait a minute. I thought you said you didn't get a single response. Well, yeah, a bugle is how they respond. No. And honestly, some of the responses that we have heard so far this year are not bugles. They are low grunts. They are low huffs. They are raking. They are low audible sounds that you really have to be listening for and paying attention to. If you're not really focusing and listening to those, you're going to miss them and you're just going to be walking right by elk. So what is going on right now is, <coughs> excuse me, the elk are spread out. We've also had, at least here in Idaho, we've had several storm systems move through that has brought a lot of unsettled weather. And so what you have is you have this barometric pressure that's going up and going down and going up and going down. What we have found is when that barometric pressure drops down into the 29 range, that's when we're actually seeing and hearing some bugling action. When that barometric pressure is up above 30, not getting anything. So... Uh, too much rain here in Wyoming and the rut has finally begun. So, okay, I saw a question here. Al, 2020, if it is going to take several trips or a long time to pack meat out, what do you think is the best method? Debone it right away or hang it on the bone and then debone it when it's ready to be packed out? I honestly am not a fan of boning. I never debone my elk. I always leave quarters in or bone in. To me, I think it's easier to handle, it's easier to pack, it's easier to control, it's easier to hang. Um, so if it's going to take a while, find a cool, dark, shaded area. If there's a creek there, you can take sticks and you can build a meat cache. Put it high enough above the water that you can lay those quarters on those sticks. So it's going to be shaded all the time. You have the cool temp of the creeks rolling by, and so that cool air is going to cool that meat down faster, and it's going to buy you more time for getting that meat out. So, Al, that's what I would do. So uh, my dad got a cow today. I'm trying to get a bull with my bow. Redneck Canadian memes. Congratulations to your dad, and good luck to you. So, uh, Scott, I had a guy follow me all the way up a drainage, always out of sight. Anytime uh, I bugle, he would go crazy with really bad cow calls. Some people are that way. And I am guilty in the past of if somebody's doing that with me and knowing my area well enough, I will send my hunting partners to where we want to hunt. And I will basically bugle and drag that individual over into another drainage or basin and then slip out the backside and go you know go quiet slip out the back and then go meet with my hunting partners and then i drop that person far enough over um scott you really can't control or maybe what you can do is is it, it, it you might even want to just sit down on the mountain if you know he's following you sit down and let him catch up and then have a talk with him so but have a rational talk. So, and sometimes it's, it's, you know, some of these people weren't really raised with mentors. They weren't really raised with family members that taught them ethics, or they were raised by that individual that this is our family hunting grounds and you just go wherever you want, boy. So, but sometimes too, they just don't know any difference. And sometimes they're just so new, Scott, that they might not even know that you're, a hunter they might think you're an elk so sometimes just sitting down and having a conversation with that person can make your hunt better and can make their hunt better as well so 
Uh, how do you hunt a good wallow pit? Uh, acknowledge it and move on, call near it, etc. Uh, David, there's a lot of different things you can do. Uh, you can sit on it during midday. Um, you know, if you have a trail camera on it and you have kind of a time of day when elk are coming into it, whether it's a morning wallow or an evening wallow or a midday, um, if it's morning or evening, you can actually sit by that wallow and do some blind calling routines from it or uh, like I said, midday, just sit there, do a few cow calls and see if a bull is going to get up out of his bed and come over and, um, you know, hit that wallow. So, um, you know, some people actually just put tree stands up on them and they'll go up and sit in a tree stand above that wallow sometimes, sometimes if it's a good active wallow. So you have a lot of options on what you can do there. So. Uh, question. Uh, so we got on an elk. I was 100 yards back with my friend was up front stalking. He said he was hung up on a tree line. I waited till he chuckled. So I did the same back and ran back and forth hitting dead trees. Was that the right move? Um, I don't know, Robbie. What, how, did the, how did the bull respond to that? What did he do? I mean, did he respond back to you? Did he go quiet? Um, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors that need to be known now here's the deal to think about also Robbie there's not just this one simple response that when you get in that situation this is exactly what you do because what you do today that didn't work may work tomorrow with that bull their mindsets change from day to day and sometimes from morning to evening so what he doesn't want to hear in the morning he may like it in the afternoon so uh, FS, I've heard a lot of grunts, only a few bugles. Yeah, same thing. We've been hearing a lot of low audible. Uh, so I'm, if I'm calling a bull, how long do I wait to bugle? Uh, redneck, it really depends on his response pattern. How vocal is he? If he's bugling quite a bit, you can you don't really have to wait that long. Um, if, if his bugles are spread out, then you want to spread out your calling. Match your environment and match that bull that you're calling to, but also pay attention to how he's responding to the sounds that you're doing. Pay attention to how he responds to your cow calls and pay attention to how he responds to your bugles because he's going to tip his hat and he's going to tell you what he likes and what he's wanting to hear that day. It's your job to pick up on those cues and give him what he wants. All right, uh, first year hunting elk in Eastern Washington. Lots of sign last weekend and only one herd any advice be patient so uh when i called the bull and cows in they were about 50 yards he bugled when the cows came towards me it was really low i expected him to be loud not necessarily um you know they're not always max volume remember they have low audible communications too so it's not always max volume max effort um, it's just like when you're having a conversation with somebody, you know, do you scream at the shot of your lungs or, you know, maybe if it's a private conversation, you kind of get a little closer and you bring, you know, your voice level down and you just kind of talk a little bit softer because you only want that conversation between you and that person. So elk, elk are exactly the same way. So, uh, I'm headed to Colorado and talk to people and they said elk were at 11,000 feet. How do I know what elevation I'm at and do they change as rep progresses? Um, it's, it's going to vary from area to area. And, you know, are, are they still going to be there as the rut really kicks in? Hard to say. I mean, are they, are they already herded up with cows? Are they, you know, have they gone to lower elevations, looped up the cows and brought them up into their rutting areas? Um, really, I mean, the best advice I can give you is when you get into your area, start low and work high. Let the sign tell you where the elk are at. So... Um, and that's just, it, it's going to vary from area to area. Uh, you know, first weekend we were finding elk between 6,800 and 7,200 feet. This past weekend, because of the storms that roll in, rolled in, we found them down around 5,000 feet. So, in fact, we went up high at first. There wasn't any fresh sign. Um, and as soon as we dropped down lower, that's where we, we got into them. So, all right. Um, it was obvious he thought he was following a bull up the drainage. He even tried cow calling from further away to make the bull think the cow was going away. I stopped bugling and he went up a different draw. Okay, there you go. So, 
Uh, Nicholas Curry hunted northern Idaho last week and didn't hear a thing or see anything but whitetail. Didn't see any rubs, but lots of tracks. Uh, hiked all over the place morning till night. Okay, so let's let, let's kind of recap last weekend. Um, we put two bulls on the ground in less than a 24-hour period. That was elk on the ground, packed out, back to camp in less than a 24-hour period. Um, Friday evening, uh, you know, I got into camp about 4, 4.30, um, and then Eric and Chris kind of came in right about the same time I did. We unloaded the trucks and threw our camo on, jumped in the truck, and we went over to hunt an area that we haven't hunted at this year. Um, just because wanted to kind of explore up above where we normally do in this area and it's funny because we parked the truck we walked a total of 300 and we walked through an area that we have called in last year walked past it a little bit found an old cut road and went up and we were 326 yards from the truck and i basically went through my location series uh on, on cow sounds which is basically just lost excited loud muse um i didn't even get to a bugle i did three of those and immediately we had a cow roll off the face across us and a bull come running out from the above us in the draw came out so we set up and uh i ended up calling that bull into 17 yards for uh eric and the bull actually ran and dropped right in the area that we normally set up and call from and that was 200 yards from the road. Uh, got to him right when the lightning and thunder was starting. Got him off the mountain. Got back to camp. He never said a peep. Never said a word. The cow never said a word. We just happened to be right place, right time with those guys. Uh, Saturday morning, like I said, we got up. Did the first blind calling set up and that's the video that i posted on the patreon page so you guys could see the whole cadence with that breeding sequence and how i move and the sounds that i do and um all of the sounds on that video were done with open read cow calls and external read bugles i didn't use a diaphragm read at all we didn't get anything on this travel corridor so we went up higher and basically went up high and like i said we weren't finding any tracks so we looped back down into a rub meadow which is a meadow that we found on opening weekend that has about 20 rubs and set up on it started doing the calling sequence and i think the second cow run that i went through all of a sudden um we just got a bull and all he did was just and this is 10.45, 10.30, 10.45 in the morning. This bull was in his bed. And so I started ramping up the excitement. And all of a sudden, he started kind of getting more involved and bugling a little more. And it's kind of funny because he, he hit me with a modified, not a real aggressive challenge, but he hit me with kind of like, a, okay. And I kind of cut him off when he was chuckling with one and it's funny from that point on he never got aggressive again he basically just kind of paced back and forth and he kept doing a roundup bugle he kept trying to call my cow to him um, but the only thing was was he was not alone we actually got set up right near a group of four bulls that were bedded down and got all four of those bulls out of their bed and one of them ended up walking about 25 yards from brandon and he dumped it um but basically this bull just um that was really the best bugle action that we have had so far um but again that barometric pressure was was down in that 29 range which that's kind of you know golden from what i've seen so um that was really the only action that we saw all weekend um you know we had another storm come in saturday night uh we didn't really do much sunday morning so looking forward to kind of getting back out but the the thing is is had we been just hiking around doing location bugles and trying to get a response or trying to get an answer 
we wouldn't have gotten any, anything because we were taking care of Brandon's bull when those other two guys came walking down and I was talking to them and I was like, oh, are you guys hearing anything? And they're like, no, we've, we've been moving along along this face and bugling and we haven't heard anything back. And we heard a couple of bulls over here. So we started working that way. And I was like, yeah, that was, that was Bryce and I kind of bugling back and forth, trying to create some excitement and stuff. And so, so now also those guys that know we hunt this area, if they hear a bugle, they're not going to really know if it's an actual elk or if it's Bryce and I. So that's kind of part of the process with talking to them as well um but what we we're still kind of in that deal that we're not seeing this heavy rutting activity and i think a lot of you guys are 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 kind of expecting this heavy rut activity where you can just cover ground and bugle and locate and get responses and they're just they're not right there yet and so our approach is and i talked about this i think a couple of weeks ago where take your time if you're finding fresh sign, take your time, work that area, spend time in that area. You'll really be surprised how many elk are actually in that area. I saw a couple of questions here. Let me jump back. Uh, to, 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 to. Yes, this is the, uh, this is the live. So, um, uh, Dave, hey Mike, can you give me a quick answer on hunting in the rain? So, okay, yeah, that question came in today about hunting in the rain. Yes, the elk will still be moving in the rain, and yes, hunting in the rain can be effective. But here's my take on it. If it's just a light drizzle, I will hunt in it. But if it's a heavy downpour, typically I'm not going to hunt in it because that heavy downpour, that heavy rain can wash away your blood trail and can wash away the tracks. And if you don't see that animal fall in sight, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to find it. Now, yes, I know if you only have limited number of time, if you have, say, five days to hunt and it's going to rain for three of them, you don't have any option. You have to hunt during that. So, but yeah, the elk will still be moving in the rain. The rain doesn't shut them down. So if like in the case where we were with those storms that came through, it was lightning and thunder and pretty heavy rains that may push them off the higher elevations and push them down into lower elevations so that they can seek refuge and get out of that weather but even though they're lower on the mountain they're still going to be moving around they still have to eat they still have to drink they still have to do all that stuff so uh i'm headed to colorado oh wait we talked about that uh do, 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 do. what do you do when the elk aren't talking i volume bugle everybody thinks they're not talking there's plenty of other sounds and it's those low audible sounds like i've talked about those those little grunts those huffs those rakings these are all low audible sounds that if you're not paying attention to you're not going to hear them so uh i started hunting elk a few years ago and has been a challenge to say population and elk numbers are actually growing um, there's units here in Idaho that are that way, um, units in Eastern Oregon that are that way. Um, so no elk numbers in several areas are still on the rise. Now, are there areas where the elk numbers have dropped? Yes, there are. You, you have both scenarios going on, but whenever you hear a local sit there and say, oh, the glory days are gone. It's just really not worth your time to hunt here. Hmm. Is he really telling you the truth or is he telling you a line of garbage to get you out of that area so that you won't find out how good it is? Locals are very protective of their hunting areas, especially if you're an out of the area person or a non-resident from out of state. They're probably not really going to give you truthful information. All right. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So, and we haven't even gone over to the questions yet. Uh, elk are rather quiet up here in my area, hoping they are talking by Friday. Yeah, th they are getting more and more vocal. Um, and as we get closer, because here's the thing too, is so elk are going to be vocal when they're establishing their pecking order. Okay, when they're establishing who the dominant bull is, who, who, who's not the dominant bull, and when they're rounding up cows. 
Now, once they have their cows around, because basically that bull, he's focusing on feeding and fattening up and just waiting for the cows. Are you going to sound off? Are you going to let other bulls know where you're at? No. You're going to hang out in your little place, wait for your cows to come in heat. Why do it before that? So, okay. Ha. Uh, when does the bugle leave your ears? Because I still hear them, LOL. Robbie, it never leaves your ears. So I hear them all year long. So Scott, I got to put your teaching to use. I heard a bugle uh, from about up yards away and responded with a chuckle. A few minutes later, I cow called and got a lip ball in response. Hunter. Um, <laughs> Glenn, is this a live feed? Yes, it is. Um, Robbie, could you give an example of some cow calls? I'm not sure my buddy was doing it correctly or is there a right... So, I mean, that's just an example of some cow calls. Now, everybody is going to sound a little bit differently. They're going to have a little different tones, just like we all have different voices. Elk have different voices. So, Craig, real sharp, sharp shooter outdoors. How you doing, bud? So, um, you know, was he doing it correctly? I, I mean, Robert, it really depends on what story was he trying to tell, what picture. No, I, I mean, Cody, sometimes, I, I mean, Cody, when you go fishing, do you only take one lure? Do you only take one spinner or, or, or do you do you take others? So, I mean, an open read cow call. Here's, here's the thing. Don't pigeonhole yourself into using mouth reads only. Um, you know, that's one thing I noticed earlier this year when I posted a video uh, of a bull that I called in for a buddy a few years ago. And I'm just, I, I'm watching this hunt and I'm using some open read cow calls and I'm listening to how these bulls are responding. And then all of a sudden I realized, man, the last three or four years, I really haven't used any open read calls. Why? Why did I go away from it? Why did I pigeon my whole my why did I pigeonhole myself only into just using this one thing? I mean, it's a different pitch. It's a different tone. It's a different vibration level. If you're not getting any responses with mouth reads, why not mix it up and try it? Why not try something different? Maybe it has a different frequency to it that that bull's going to like. So, um, now part of the reason opening weekend, the reason I was using open read calls is because I took a bite of a brat the night before the hunt and the brat was still really hot and I burnt the top of my mouth. I burnt the roof of my mouth. I couldn't, it wasn't comfortable for me to put a diaphragm read up there. So opening weekend, I just focused on those open read cow calls and external read bugles. And then last weekend I did it because I wanted to get some video footage of it because some people have said, oh, you can't be successful using those. And so I wanted to show, yes, you can. You don't have to use a diaphragm read to call an elk or be successful. Open read cow calls are extremely effective. External read bugles, extremely effective. But you have to put your time in to practice on those and be proficient at them and understand how they work and understand how to do the vocalizations. That's the main thing is understand the vocalizations and understand the message that you're portraying by the sounds that you're throwing out there. So, um, so Cody, no, I, I, would it change if, if I were solo? No, actually with last weekend, I wouldn't hesitate to use open read cow calls and external read bugles if I was solo. In fact that I was using the, the, the Power Bugle Pro, which you know they just came out with September of last year. That thing sounds dang good out there in the mountains. And it's so easy to use and you can do all of your vocalizations on it. But um, so no, I, it, it wasn't any specific reason, it's just, I just wanted to, so. Uh, FS, I was calling a bull in last Friday, had him coming into about 80 yards, storm, storm rolled in, bull turned, stopped raining, tried getting him 
back on the horn, nothing. Is that normal? Yeah, sometimes it can be. Or, you know, sometimes he just got to that point and changed his mind. Hmm, I don't feel like coming in. So uh, they're animals. We, ca we can't make... Yeah, who... Who knows? And it could be, too, that maybe he rolled out of that area and was just out of earshot, and that's why you couldn't relocate him again. So, uh, I love reads op with open reads the same. My goal is to make it sound like a party, and that bull was invited into early October 12th, 15th in New Mexico. Jeremy, I have no idea. Typically, yes, there is still rutting activity going on around that time. You still have some cows that are coming in light, late cycle, or maybe they didn't get bred on, the, on their their cycles so they're coming back in around that time um also too you know if, if it's going to be a bad winter it could push the rut late so you could have really having heavy rutting activity at that time of year i mean it, it just it's it's one of those things that's really really hard to just kind of predict and say yes or no so uh jc fisk christensen what does your base camp consist of uh so basically um our base camp, there are two camp trailers, um, a Cabela's Outback Lodge, a screen octagon tent for cooking. Um, Kelly's got his tent up also. So it's kind of a mixture of tents and uh, trailers. So uh, kudos for you for not hunting during heavy rain for tracking reasons. Glenn, it's, it's hard enough to track sometimes. I could only, and, and I've been out there in the rainstorm and, and it just, it's, it's heartening. It is really, really heartening when all of your sign is just completely washed away. So, uh, Andrew bumped a small herd of elk up a ridge line. Wind was in my favor. So I closed 300 yards quick and stayed with their tracks. After taking a route through slowly, I came through the timber over the ridge line and looked across an ATV trail they had crossed to see them in the dark timber across the way. The cow at the rear, who I believe was the re lead cow, noticed me, so I put my head down and watched the other cow start grazing. Just then, the back cow turned her head, and I was able to draw back on a good five point. But right when I got to full draw, she kicked them off. Could I have done any different? No, I mean, when, when you already bump a herd, they're going to kind of be cautious of what's going on on the back trail. So, you know, they're always looking over their shoulder and stuff. Um, you know, sometimes what we'll do is if we bump them, we'll just kind of let them go for a little bit and then we'll take a different route. We won't follow their same tracks um, come in from a different angle because when you follow their tracks you're doing a predatory response and you're acting just like a predator whether it was a bear or a wolf or this or that because you know that wolf is basically just going to be nose down following the scent of that track and basically tracking those animals down so that's why we will typically come in from a different direction so uh, okay I got to check uh, to do to do to do Okay, Rick, last weekend saw groups of bulls with bulls still grouped up and not that vocal. Do I stay real strong with the breeding sequence or do I call a little softer when I see these bulls grouped up? So, um, I, I, I mean, yeah. If they're not vocal, I mean, you, you basically end up getting into areas and you do blind calling scenarios with the breeding sequences, what we do. Um, you know, if... We're in that area for an hour. If nothing happens, we ro re relocate to another area, set up, and we do it again. The thing is, 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 you know, whether you call a little softer or full on, here's one thing that I've seen from a lot of people is when they start getting into their sequence, they're going from zero to 100 just like that. You've got to start soft and build up the excitement. You can't just... You, you can't just go from a quiet forest to a thousand people rave in an instant. So build it up. Start slow. Build it up. Think of building a fire and basically just kind of stay with that. So, um, you know, and, and have patience. That's, that's the some of those that are being patient in working areas. And what I'm finding is these, these people are actually getting into elk and calling into elk. Then there's the impatience that 
aren't really working these areas or they only work them for 15, 20 minutes. Nothing's here. Nothing's coming in. We haven't heard anything. Let's move on. It's a tough thing because you'll sit there with patients and all of a sudden in your head, it starts going. There's a bull over that ridge that's bugling. You don't have anything right here that's bugling, but there's a bull that's over there that's bugling. You need to advance. You, you need to uh, abandon what you're doing here, and you need to haul butt over there because you, you, that bull's. Bu have you guys ever heard that little voice in your head? You, you're sitting there. You're, you're 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 okay. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to work this area. But you start working it, and time moves slow at this point and then that little voice in your head just starts going and chirping you're wasting your time you're wasting daylight there's a bull over there i know there's a bull over there bugling you just need to go so and in the past i was guilty of that i would be like you know what yep right let's go but then as soon as i got up and started moving 50 yards down the trail i bump into an elk that's coming into me calling because i wasn't patient enough so especially early on in the season patience is key it's not a race or, or it's not a sprint it's be patient work areas so uh so there is so they're not in rut yet well yes they are nicholas um you have different stages of the rut you have pre-rut you have peak rut you have post rut so when you say rut a lot of people just think of that mass bugling action and excitement and all this that is the peak rut so what we're going through is the pre-rut right now with the staging the dominance establishing of the dominance the rounding up of the cows the moving the cows back into the rutting areas the staging and getting ready for cows to start coming into estrus and cycles and get that excitement going so they're being patient waiting for that rut why not be patient so it's just like i asked a couple of weeks ago are you moving through the forest and calling like a human or are you moving through the forest and calling and acting like an elk that's the question you need to ask yourself That's true, because all the local hunters from here say that calling don't work, that they are too smart. So, um, oh yeah, you'll hear that a lot from people too. Ah, if you call in my area, I'll run the other way. Perfect. So, uh, Michael, in regards to calling Rocky Mountain and Rosetta elk, elk, do you approach the same calling techniques or do you change it up? Can you elaborate on any differences? Bill, I really don't change it up, and I've actually taught several students that hunt and live in Roosevelt country, and they've applied um, kind of the Elk Calling Academy approach and Elk Calling Academy tactics, and they've had, you know, good success on Roosevelt's. So uh, the only difference is, is really between Rocky Mountain and Roosevelt's is Rocky Mountain elk will typically live in areas that are a little more open so you can hear their bugles at longer distances where roosevelt's live in really really thick vegetation where that sound is really knocked down and it doesn't travel very far at all so you have to be close before you can really uh you know hear them and so that's where your setups and your patience and all that really come into play a lot more so um Okay, we already covered that one. So let me check Instagram questions real quick. Okay, when does a long distance shot change from hunting to simply long range shooting at live targets? Ooh, Jacob, ah, good question, tough question. So the whole debate or question about shot distance and shot length, I mean, I, I'm not here to tell you what your ethics are or anything like that for me personally my longest shot that i'm going to take on a on a bull is 40 yards on the first shot um now if i already have an arrow in a bull and i need to do a follow-up shot so yeah i'll stretch that out a little bit but everybody's effectiveness is different 
I mean, the guy that spends almost every weekend at the range shooting his gun is going to be more proficient and can reach out farther than that guy that takes his rifle out two weeks before the season and plinks a few holes in the paper. So that question really is going to vary from person to person. Um, do I agree with some of these 80, 90, 100 yard shots on elk? No, I don't agree with it. So it's a wild animal that's extremely tough. Um, the kinetic energy and momentum and everything that you lose in that arrow, um, you're just asking for trouble. Plus when that shot breaks, the time for that arrow to travel that far and that elk to move, you can actually get yourself into a very nasty situation. And shot placement is critical. I can guarantee you get on one bad track because you took a marginal shot. You will rethink about your shot angles and shot opportunities from that point on. It only takes one time being on a track job like that and the sickening feeling that you get in your stomach and how it affects you. Now, there's people out there that doesn't bother them at all. At all. It, it, it doesn't matter. They're like, eh, so what? I'll go find another one. Those are piss poor hunters and piss poor people. But unfortunately, there's people like that out there. So, uh, Lena, you said the autumn equinox triggers the rut. What triggers cows to go into estrus? Okay, that is that autumn equinox. It's the equal amount of daylight and darkness. And it's how, because that sun is changing and it gets to a certain point and how the light reflects off of her pupil and enters her pupil is basically, those are all the things, the equal amount, how the light reflects the pupil. Those are all the things that trigger and start that rut. If we're currently pre-rut, how do we determine estrus timeframes? So the thing about the estrus timeframes is, remember, most cows are bred within a 7 to 10 day window of that autumn equinox. This year it's the 23rd. It's, it's Monday, Monday the 23rd. So 7 to 10 days. Okay, that autumn equinox could be the end of those 7 to 10 days. It could be the middle of the 7 to 10 days, or it could be the start. So... Typically, that's kind of when the peak rut is going to happen, and that's when most cows, excuse me, most cows are, cows are bred. Um, I mean, how can we really determine it? It's really tough. We can't really just look at a calendar and go, it's going to be on this date. So the thing I've been seeing, though, is I'm starting to see fall colors start to change which those are typically a good indication when you start seeing fall colors changing because the light intensity from the sun is changing, which those are just basically going to start triggering. So, all right, guys, I know, man, there are a ton of questions that I got to get through here, but unfortunately we only have 30 seconds left. The countdown has started. So we are going to have to wrap this up for tonight. Thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in tonight. I will be on next Wednesday. Um, right after that, I'm going to head up to camp for the long hunt. But yes, next Wednesday, we'll, we will be live. So keep after it. Keep patience, persistence. Stay after it, guys. As always, keep calling, keep practicing. Most importantly, though, have fun. And we'll see all of you guys next week on the next episode of Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. See you later, guys.